Hey man, well, it's good to be back on the radio again today. We certainly do appreciate the good Lord allowing us to be able to come to you by means of radio. This is the Barrett Baptist Church broadcast. We certainly are privileged to be the pastor there. We thank you so much for tuning in to our program. It's a great blessing to hear from folks each week uh, who listen to our radio broadcast. And I certainly do pray the Lord to help us today uh, as we continue in Psalm 32. As we've mentioned several times already, Psalm 32 is a penitent psalm. It is a psalm of repentance. David is repenting of uh, some sin that he has committed. And we've talked about in the first two verses, we talked about the blessing of forgiveness. In verses three and four, we talked about the blessing of conviction. And with the help of the Lord today, we are going to start talking about the blessing of confession. So we're going to read verses one through six of Psalm 32, and we'll stop and pray together. And then we'll get right into the broadcast today. We do hope it'll be a help and a blessing unto you. The Bible says in Psalm 32, verse number one, the Bible says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man in whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture is turned into the drought of summer, Selah. Verse number five says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to pray. It is a blessing, Lord, to be able to come to you in prayer. And I do pray that you would help us today to be a blessing and a help to God's people. Lord, use us to say those things that are beneficial and helpful and needful. And please help us to refrain from saying anything that would be offensive uh, to God or not be a blessing to the Lord and not be according to his word. And we'll sure thank you for that. We sure love you. We sure thank you for loving us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I should have read one more verse. I meant to read verse number six as well. Verse number six says, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great water they shall not come nigh unto him. Now the last word in verse number four and the last word in verse number five is selah. Now the word selah is an instruction. It is an instruction for us to pause, if you will, or to consider what is being said or to consider what is taking place. Uh, now, so in this particular psalm, as I've mentioned, uh, it, it is a is a penitent psalm. And we're talking about now in verses five and six, the blessing of confession. But before we talked about the blessing of conviction. And so if the convicting hand of God is pressing hard upon us, we should certainly pause. We should take a pause and consider what is wrong in our lives. And we should stop and thank God for dealing with us as his children. Now, if we have confessed our sin to God and he has forgiven us, we should certainly stop and consider how unworthy we are that God would forgive us. And uh, we should take some time to be very thankful about the fact that we are forgiven by such a loving Savior. Now, listen, our relationship with God needs constant maintenance. Now, that's not because we're concerned with losing our relationship with God, but we our, our relationship needs constant maintenance because we want to maintain in good fellowship with God. And so this, uh, this constant maintenance uh, and demands that we get right with God and we need to get right with God when we need to do so every time that we need to do so. Listen, it, it, it doesn't take long to get, uh, I, I don't really know how to phrase this really, but it doesn't take really long to get out of the will of God. We can be walking in consistent or constant fellowship one day and the very next day we could be as mean as the devil and need to seek God for forgiveness in our lives. In fact, it don't take the next day. You can be in church on Sunday morning and uh, have a good heart towards God and and uh, be in good fellowship with God and his people, be rejoicing uh, because of the things of God and the blessings of the God and the goodness of the Lord and uh, go out to the car 
Sometimes before you leave the church building, you will be confronted uh, by people or situations that if you're not really careful, it'll take you a while to get your, the cobwebs cleared out of your head and, you'll, and get your heart cleaned back up so you can fellowship with God again the way you would like to. But oftentimes we, we start down the road and, and uh, someone doesn't you know, drive exactly as perfectly as we do. We get a little upset with them and, um, or maybe there's a spat between the children or the wife or the spouse. And, and so it doesn't take all of that long to get things all out of whack and all out of focus concerning the things of the Lord. Now, in verse number five, David said, I acknowledged. Now, when we get into trouble and we try to hide our sin and we try to brush our sin off, uh, other times we may even try to ignore our sin or sometimes we're guilty of trying to justify our sin by finding what we believe to be as a good excuse for our sin. And uh, But we see in the context that David finally chooses to repent. And when we confess our sin to the Lord, we are agreeing with God that what we have done or what we are doing is offensive to him. And our attitude is, Lord, you're right and I am wrong. And so David has finally reached that point in this psalm. And he said, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. Now, notice what David does here. He goes directly to the Lord. David said later in that verse, I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. Now, there's no true repentance in confessing your sin to a pastor, and there's no true repentance in confessing your uh, transgression and sin to a friend. There's no forgiveness granted because you have decided to be more faithful to church, and there's no forgiveness granted because you finally decided to do what the Bible has commanded us to do all along, and that is to be a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not uh, forgiven and cleansed because you... Uh, decided to put a little extra money in the offering box or in the offering plate. No, you're, you're not forgiven because you've decided to, uh, to do something that you should have been doing all along anyway. No, when we are forgiven, it's because we have acknowledged to God, we have confessed to God that we have sinned. Now, the Bible says in, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if we confess our sins, that's the only way, amen, that we can get forgiveness. Now, the verse says, the verse says, Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord. Now, notice the result. And thou forgave us the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Now, how marvelous is the grace of our God. What a great hymn that is, but what a greater truth that is. Amen. How great are his mercies. How tender are his compassions. He has the ability to, and he is willing to, forgive our sin. Now, what a tremendous blessing it is to know that our God responds to the brokenhearted man who humbly cries out to God in sincerity and the forgiveness is granted by the God of all grace. What a blessing that is to have a God of forgiveness. You know, the Bible says this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 10, the Bible says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Now, so I, I'm glad that God is able to forgive the God of all grace. Now, I want to go for the remainder of the broadcast will probably be in 2 Samuel chapter number 12. Now, and actually, I want to actually read a, some of the verses here, make some short, short comments about Nathan confronting David concerning his sin and David confessing his sin that is mentioned here in Psalm 32. Now, I have no intentions of turning this into a study of 2 Samuel. This is just uh, going to be a quick look at David's confession. 
We've already gone through chapter 11 on last week's broadcast. We talked about David's sin with Bathsheba. Uh, the prophet Nathan is going to confront David about his sin here in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. And I, I want to say this just as a just a, for reference for those of you who are interested. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 could be easily outlined uh, in, in uh, a, a good five-point outline. You have the confrontation between David and Nathaniel in verses uh, one through six. Second of all, you have the confirmation in verses seven through nine. Then you have the calamity in verses 10 and 12. And then number four, you have the confession in verse 13. And then verse and, and number five, you have the consequences, verses 14 through 18. And so David is acknowledging, he's confessing his sin in Psalm 32. And we turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 12 and we read, begin reading to see what led up to that acknowledgement and that confession of sin. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number one, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. I want you to remember this. I want you to think about this. God always has a man for the job. David has failed. David has sinned. David has committed some wicked and ungodly acts. But David isn't the only man that God has. I'll tell you this too, my friend. I'm not the only man that God has. And you're not the only man that God has. And the Lord certainly has a man to get the job done. Ain't that a blessing? Listen, our nation is in a mess. Sin is rampant. It's on every side. Folks are immoral. Folks are ungodly. But I promise you, the Lord isn't sitting up in heaven worried if he's going to run out of preachers or if he's going to run out of men who will stand up for what is right. He's not concerned about that. And he's not worried about that because he's not going to run out of men who would do that which is pleasing to God. Amen. Now, Nathan, Nathan is about to do what Jesus did often in his earthly ministry. And that is Nathan is going to use a parable to teach David a much needed lesson. And we certainly know that throughout the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he often used parables to teach valuable lessons to mankind. That's exactly what Nathan's going to do. The Bible says in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, verse number 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and he said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Now, I want to sort of interrupt the parable as, as we go along and, and make some comments as we do that. If we were to read through the parable, we would find out when we got to verse number seven that Nathan tells David, thou art the man. And so I'll say it like this. David is the rich one in this parable, referred to as the rich one. And Uriah is referred to as the poor one. So that, that help you understand the parable as we go along. So verse number two says, the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. Now we know that David, as the king, he already has several wives and several concubines. Verse number three says, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. So Uriah didn't have much in this world. He certainly didn't have the wealth of the king, only the wife that he had from his youth. And uh, he had managed to pay her father a dowry and they had grew up together as many uh, married couples do seemingly. It is quite possible that he, that they even had children and he had taken care of her, making sure that her needs were sufficiently met. In fact, he cared for her as though she was his daughter. And so we can see the tender relationship that Uriah had with his wife Bathsheba. Now, verse number four says, And there come a traveler unto the rich man. And he spake, and he spared to take of his own flock, of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was coming to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Now, the rich man, David, remember we mentioned that. 
We know that he is rich monetarily. He is the king. He has great physical or mon- uh, monetary wealth, if you will. But think, about, think with me about this, if you will, for just a minute. Here, let's consider him rich because of the new man or the new nature. David's a man, the Bible says, is, is a man after God's own heart. Now, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse number 10, it says, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, yet poor as making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. So those of us that are in Christ, we may not have a lot monetarily. We may not have a lot of physical possessions, but we certainly are rich in the things of the Lord. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter eight and verse number nine says, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So David here allows the old man, the old nature, the traveler or the wayfaring man to rule his lust and to dictate his actions. Man, may the Lord please help you. May the Lord please help me that are saved and born again. We are possessors of of the new creature, amen. Uh, May God help us not to allow that old traveling, wayfaring, sinful, idemic nature that we still possess to rule our lust and dictate our actions. So listen, David has plenty of his own wives, but he wanted what didn't belong to him. So he took the poor defenseless man's wife to be his own. Now, just a side note here. It doesn't matter how many women or how many men, whichever the case may be, that you have in your life, they will never bring you the satisfaction or the happiness that you desire or that you're seeking for. The only way you're ever going to be satisfied and the only way you're ever going to have satisfaction is to have to be born again and have fellowship with the Savior. That's, that's what it's going to require in order for you to be content. I thank God for contentment. Amen. What a blessing it is to be con- content with the things of God and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, listen to me. I, I don't want to sound dirty or, uh, or irreverent or anything like that at all. But at the same time, I want you to understand the depravity of a sin that, uh, our, that is just rampant in our nation and not just in our nation, but among many professing Christians as well, who they make light of and live in adultery and fornication on a rampant basis. And they, they are, they'll be living in, in adultery and fornication and singing in the choir and teaching Sunday school and being faithful to church. And nobody says anything about it. Listen, friend, that's wicked in the eyes of God, amen. And so, listen, it's a sin. I'm talking about the sin is a man having another man's wife. The Bible says here, but he took the poor man's lamb. He's talking about Bathsheba and dressed it for the man that was coming to him. So Nathan just told David, you just took another man's wife, a man who was in no position to defend her because you had sent him off to war and you treated her like a man would treat a piece of meat. And uh, so listen to me, young girls, young lady, you're listening to the sound of my voice. If all that guy wants to do is to get you off somewhere where you can be alone so he can put his hands all over you, he doesn't value you at all. He isn't interested in you. He, he is simply trying to satisfy, satisfy his fleshly lust and desires. He doesn't care anything about you. He just wants to add you to his herd. You say, preacher, you're, you're, uh, that's, that's pretty blunt. That's over the line. I'm not over the line. I should probably be more direct than I am I, that, because it seems that if no one is speaking out against this sin anymore, including most parents, it's wicked. It's ungodly. They're more interested in their little girls being popular and they're more interested in their little girls fitting in with the crowd and they're more interested in their little girls looking like the world and dressing like the world and acting like the world And they they don't have any concern about them being pure and clean on their wedding day. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. It's no different for the boys either. Amen. Some of these daddies kind of sort of slide their boy a high five because he's put another notch in his belt. What you ought to do is get on your knees and get right with God, amen, and realize how wicked and ungodly such foolish and sinful living is. It's, It's wicked in the eyes of God. Amen. It's still sin. It's still sin. 
Praise the Lord. Look at verse number five. We're still in 2 Samuel 12. And David's anger was kindled greatly against the man. And he said unto Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Now, unfortunately, David hasn't caught on yet. He doesn't realize that in this parable, he is both the rich man and the traveler in the story. Now, be, be careful that you don't get too judgmental of David here. Oftentimes we do that. And uh, many believers have not caught up with the fact that their flesh is involved in the things that are very displeasing to God. David is the rich man. This traveler, this wayfaring man is the flesh that David is still contending with. And oftentimes my flesh and your flesh gets in the way of this new man that God has created us to be and it causes us some problems. Now, David rushes to judgment here. He's angry. And the Bible says his anger was greatly kindled against the man. David doesn't even realize that he's angry at himself. And so he, he issues a rash statement. He says, kill him. Now, listen, the punishment, the punishment that David is recommending is above what is required by the law for stealing the lamb. If I'm I haven't read up on it, but if I'm not mistaken, you're supposed to replace it sevenfold. So uh, we, we have the lamb, the, the, the still in the lamb is, is not punishable by death. But I'll tell you this, David is guilty of murder and David is guilty of adultery, both of which are punishable by death under the law. And so David has a problem that many of us have from time to time. And that is that we can clearly see the sin in other people's life but we fail to see the sin in our own lives. Now, Brother James said, if there's ever been an illustration of straining at a gnat while swallowing a camel, it is here. And boy, that, that is definitely the truth. We see that. Listen, this is why fellowship and preaching is so vital. This is why we cannot choose friends or preachers who aid us in our self-love and our self-devotion. We got to have folks in our lives who will tell us the truth. Now, I know oftentimes that the truth is not pretty. And uh, many folks, in, including myself as well, oftentimes are not all that interested in, in hearing the truth. But David needed Nathan in his life because Nathan was not afraid to tell him the truth in this situation. Now, Nathan could have got killed. David is the king. Nathan could have just had, David could have just had his head whacked off if he wanted to because he didn't want to hear what he had to say. I'm going to tell you this, so David needed Nathan in his life because Nathan was not afraid to tell him about the situation. I, I need people. You need people in your lives. We need people in our lives. We need preachers in our lives who will stand against sin, who will stand against wickedness, and let us know when we are involved in sin. Amen. Now, look, look at verse number six. We're, we're still in 2 Samuel 12. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So David said, the lamb's going to have to be restored fourfold. Now, before this thing is said and done, David will have four family members to die. We better be very careful about how harsh we are to others because of their sin. It may very well be us the next time that is in need of some mercy. Amen. Now, look at verse number seven. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Now, I want to mention about three things here quickly. If we have time, I'd like to get through uh, this part that I want to read here in 2 Samuel 12, if I can, on today's broadcast. I want to mention about three things here uh, from these first seven verses. First of all, David never figured it out on his own. Someone had to tell him. Listen, we, we keep waiting and, and praying for someone that we know to repent and get right with God. Uh, listen, they just might, would get right with God if we would be a true friend and tell them. Now, David was in a position of authority, and Nathan, as I've already mentioned, could have, he could have some serious problems. He could have some serious fallback by talking to the king the way he was and the way that he did, but Nathan told him anyway. Listen, may God help you and I to, to speak the truth in love to those who need to hear the truth. And so, first of all, David never figured it out on his own. Somebody had to tell him. Second of all, 
David did not get mad at the messenger. Now, this is a great quality on David's part, great character on David's part to not get mad at the messenger. I've been pastoring long enough to know that people get mad at the messenger. They, they don't get mad at God. They don't get mad at God's word. They always get mad at the, the messenger. But David didn't get mad at the messenger. If you and I are guilty of sin, and that sin is pointed out to us from the Bible, and we get mad at the messenger, our heart has not been broken over our sin and will not repent, amen. And here's the third thing. It doesn't matter who you are, amen. It doesn't matter what position it is that you hold in this world. You're not above God's law. I'm not above God and you are not above God. There's not a preacher or a pastor or a church leader or a missionary or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher or anyone else who is above God. It doesn't matter who you are or what the position is. David has the highest position in the land, but Nathan, God has just sent Nathan to tell David, you're the man. And so we see that clearly here from the text. Now back to verse number seven. And Nathan said, unto, said to David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto you such and such things. I want you to notice how good God was to David and, do, and in doing so, think about how good he is to you and I as well. God here had anointed him king. God had delivered him from his enemies. God gave him wives. God gave him his houses. And then God said, if there was anything else that you wanted, I would have given you that as well. But David wasn't satisfied with all that God had given him. He had to take something on his own. And in doing so, he despised the commandment of the Lord. Look at the next verse, verse number nine. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord. And so the problem in David's life and the problem in our lives is not that we don't know what the commandments of the Lord are. We just think we can get by with despising them. Now, if you say that you love God and you despise his commandments, according to the Bible, not according to me, according to the Bible, you're a liar. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. The Bible says in John 14, 15, Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, so may the Lord help you and I to keep the commandments of God. Now, this passage goes on and I got to hurry. Uh, verse number nine, wherefore thou hast despised, hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword, with the sword of the children of Ammon. And so God knew exactly what David had done. He knew why he did it, and he knew how he did it. David knew the commandments were, God said, thou shalt not kill, but he despised the commandments of the Lord, and he did what he desired to do in his own heart. Listen, how many times, how many times have you and I, knowing exactly what the Bible says, knowing exactly what God expects, do we go contrary to what God would have us to do and do something that is completely out of line and out of the will of God? Now, I, I, I'll say this. I, I have done that, and I have paid the consequences, and I've, I have had to do the very same thing that David is doing here in Psalm 32, and that is I have confessed my sin unto the Lord and begged his forgiveness. And I am thankful that our God is a compassionate, a merciful, and a forgiving God. Listen, dear Christian friend, if you're running around with sin in your life, why don't you ask God for forgiveness and then turn from that sin, amen? Uh, repent of that sin. Don't go back to it. Ask God to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will, amen. And then go on living for God. Don't live a defeated life because you have done some things that are displeasing to God. Get the victory over it through repentance and confession. God will help you. Listen, our time is quickly coming on again today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Bear Trail Baptist Church broadcast. May God richly bless you until we meet again is our prayer. Thank you so much for watching on our social media platforms. 
God bless you for watching. Please share with others. That'd be a tremendous blessing to us. Thank you. Goodbye and God bless.